light of all the conversation about gender and identity, we began to wonder if there's even a difference between men and women anymore. We went to Seattle University to find out. I'm aware of the conversation going on in Washington State right now around kind of gender identity, gender expression issues, and the ability to access facilities on those grounds? Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, you know, there's, there's general neutral bathrooms in like all the dorms and stuff like that. I think that gender is fluid, so if you want to use a bathroom because that's a place and that's a space where you feel comfortable and safe in doing so, then I think that that's completely fine. I think that if whoever you think you are, if you're male or female, then that's the bathroom you should go into. I think if it doesn't really negatively affect anybody, then I think anyone be, should be able to choose what gender they uh, choose to identify as. People, no matter what their gender identification is, they should be allowed to use whatever restrooms they should they feel like they identify with. Is there a difference in your mind between men and women? Um, no, yes. I mean, um, possibly? In general, yes. But I don't know why I think that. Socially, currently, yes, there is. There is no need for that difference to exist. Uh, scientifically and logically. If you think that you're a male, if you think that you're a female, that matters more than the biological difference. There's not much difference besides what society forces onto people. And how do you know the difference between men and women? By what people think they are. So you can't like judge someone just on like their looks. I don't think there's any one way to really distinguish between a man or a woman, and I don't think it's necessary. Uh, it's not always consistent. It has a high probability, like 98% of the time, I can get it right. There is some ambiguity. I think, yeah, there are ways to tell, but then again, you can always be wrong. What would you say I am? Just judging off of your looks, I would say that you're a male. I would probably assume a man, but then you never know. A male. Why would you say that? Based on how I look at you. <laughs> Do you think that's a problem? Yeah, probably. Do you think the difference between men and women matters for any reason? Uh, no, not really. I think most sociologists agree that uh, the concept of gender is more of a societal construct. I do think it matters somewhat, yeah. To me, no. I don't, I don't feel as if it matters to me because uh, at the end of the day, the person is just a person. No, I don't think it should matter. And the differences on a uh, social level are simply a product of a biased society. Then is there a reason to have those labels, male or female? I don't think so. I think that it's, again, a social construct of this binary that we're given at birth. There is kind of a difference, but at the same time, if someone wants to identify as one or both or as nothing, I also find that completely okay. And There may be nothing more self-evident in the natural universe than the fact that every animal species is divided into two halves, male and female. Yet the most intelligent of those species seems to be wrestling with whether male or female are actually real things. Have we discovered something new or have we become too clever for our own good? Sometimes when I call a lady sir by accident, they get very offended. So let me ask you a question. As you were watching that, does that shock you in any way? You know, um, as a church, we believe in making disciples. And we believe that that's the role of the family. That's the role of parents. That's the role of the church body. To not only share the gospel with people, but to share the truth about where we came from, what life is about, all of that. In the next years, our, um, you know, that we're building the, the children's wing and the sports fields and all the stuff we're doing to connect with the public in a place where we can meet them so that we can um, teach character, get the opportunity to share about Jesus' love, let people see who we are and what we're about. And, and um, you know, there's so many confusing things going on in the world, but it's not just to reach outside the walls, it's to create environments where um, godly men and women can invest in young kids to get them ready for what we know is coming. Uh, 
I want you to understand that, that those kids, those college kids that are walking around the campus, very unlikely they were indoctrinated into those perspectives from their homes that they came from. Very unlikely that it was pressed into them at that level in their high schools. Very likely they weren't really educated about what they were going to hear when they got uh, later on. They probably weren't um, prepared for what they were going to hear. But when they got to college and everybody's kind of all the professors are teaching this and all the peers and all the stuff, pretty soon you could hear some threads that go all the way through, some indoctrination, some teaching. And um, our goal is to have our families, our kids ready. Not to say, hey, don't go to college. We just want them ready so that they can be a light in the world. Because what these kids are learning in college is making a mess of our culture. A mess of their, their lives. And, and, and it, it's confusing and it, it ruins things. And then, and then if we've got some Christian kids who know Jesus, who, who, are, who, who know the truth and are ready for that... It, not only so that they don't get swept down the current of where everybody else is going, but they're there to be a help, to be missionaries wherever they go in the world. That's the goal of our church. That's what we're trying to do. That's why all of our children's ministry and our youth ministry and everything we do is geared towards getting our kids ready. We're about to start a series called The Naked Truth, and we're going to talk about gender and sexuality from a biblical perspective. But I have to share with you that um, I feel some tension. <laughs> I've got to I've got to walk a line here because I know in this room right here I have a bunch of different crowds, a different different people from different backgrounds, and I know this that as a pastor, my responsibility is to teach God's word to the church, and this is a church setting. My responsibility is to say, okay. God, I, I care about your approval more than I do anybody else's. And I know these people, everything you've ever said has been because you love us and you want to protect us. And I know there's a spiritual war going on. And I know the enemy is a liar and a deceiver. And I've got to help our church family, Christians, know the truth about, you know, everything you say. To help, I, I know you need a biblical worldview. And so I'm responsible. Our elders are responsible. Our staff we take that responsibility very carefully, and so we want to teach you the truth. But at the same time, as I teach the truth from God's word, I also recognize that everybody in this room is jacked up in some way. Especially, and including me. So, I have to do it humbly, because as I start to teach the truth, maybe you weren't aware of the truth. As a Christian, maybe you're just a brand new believer, so you're not even really aware of what the Bible says. Or maybe you've been a Christian for years... And, and, and you stopped reading the Bible as you should and you started listening to the culture and you got pulled away, maybe you're just an outright rebellion. You're here today and you know what God's word says and you've just decided to be rebellious. Whatever reason you would have for being a Christian but not holding to the truth in your life as you come in, my goal is to say this is the truth. Not so I can judge you um, and and you know, make you feel terrible about yourself, because that's never God's role. God's role is to say, yes, this is right, this is wrong, this is, what you're doing may be wrong, but I love you and I want to forgive you. Come on, let's go from here. Let's go from here. So if I'm going to hit on some issues here today, that maybe you're, you've made a mistake, or maybe you're living in that mistake right now as a believer, I just want to call you back to repentance I don't want to condemn you or judge you. God's heart for you is he drew you here because he loves you and he wants to repair and heal and minister. Does that make sense? But then there's another tension I feel. I know that there are some people in here who aren't Christians. They got invited by somebody. I know that, that the culture that you may live in or come from may be more like that up there. I had a great young lady come to our home group this last week and we, in our life group and we were talking about some of this stuff, and she, she, she had this look on her face, and I just said, what's going on? What are you thinking? She, she had just gotten saved a couple of weeks before, and she goes, I'm just really shocked that you don't know that this is the world I live in. She's a 17-year-old girl in high school, and she's like, I didn't know you guys didn't know this. This is, this is what we're taught about the truth all the time, right here in our school district. 
So I'm, I'm like really confused that you didn't know this. Because our people were saying, man, the world has changed. Everything's changed. I can't believe it. She's like, it has? Because she wasn't around back then. She doesn't know. You may be one of those people that didn't know any of this. And this, this is going to press on some things in you. But I, my goal is not to offend you. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And he wants to help. He wants to minister. So while I, I have to teach the truth, I need to teach the truth. Our people need the truth. I know there are some here who are Christians who are not living out that truth, and I want to call you back to the light. And I know some haven't even, didn't even know there was a difference between dark and light. And there's that group too. I want you to know that I hope you understand the heart behind this. Is, is, it's kind of like why I would say to a little kid as I'm walking down the block, you know, they're playing out in the street and it looks all fun and they haven't hit it, no cars hit them yet, but I go up to them and I'm not like, you're bad because you're in the street. No, the street's going to kill you. Please come out of the street. You understand what I'm saying? I hope you do. We want our kids ready. We want you ready. Parents, you need to know what your kids are facing and you need to understand your role in it. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 19 with me. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about things like, how do you know there's a God? If you missed that, you know, my journey was I was a non-believer who didn't believe in God at all and looked at the science and came to the conclusion there was a God. And then I said, well, which God? And I, I actually wanted to be a Buddhist, so I started studying religion on the basis of history. How do you know a, a story is true or not? And, and, and as I started to study religion, Buddhism first, and then Islam and the rest of those religions from the historical basis to figure out is this provable or not, I came to the conclusion that the only provable religion in history is Christianity and Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that didn't make me very happy at the time because that just meant after everything I've done with my life, there's no way God for, could forgive me. And then the person who shared Christ with me shared the gospel with me. And so I believe that Jesus is the son of the living God. He's my Lord and my Savior. I believe he's historically um, provable. He's unique in all of history, and he has the right to speak. If you read in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is, uh, 2,000 years ago, he's walking around with the Jews he is a Jew. He's a, he's a prophesied Jew. Uh, the Messiah was going to be a Jew. He came at that time. The law was given by, the, by, by Jesus' Father, God the Father. Jesus is God the Son. And he's, he's walking around, and the Jews have taken the law that God had given through Moses, and they've distorted it. And so he's asked one day about marriage Back in those days, the Jews had actually taught that you could divorce your wife for any reason. If she, if she displeased you in any way, you could divorce your wife and go marry someone else. So Jesus was asked about this. And here's what he said. Verse 3, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now again, when he says, is it lawful, they ask if it's, is it lawful, they're meaning according to the Old Testament law. So he's at, they're asking, what does God say about this? Jesus has already done miracles, he's already claiming to be the son of God, they're testing him. What does God think about this? Our law says we can divorce anybody we want, anytime we want. Women were mistreated by the Jews at that time. Jesus is going to tell us some things about God's perspective of women. Jesus said this, haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning the creator made, the heaven, or made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. Now, I want you to notice before I read the rest of this, when Jesus is asked a question, when God the Son is asked the question, what does the law mean? What does the law given by God mean? I want you to notice what Jesus does. He says, haven't you read in Genesis chapter 
1 and 2, that God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. So I want you to notice before I dive into those um, definitions, he's pointing to the Old Testament scripture. And he goes on to say, God said, let us make man. So in other words, when Moses wrote that, those were actually the words of God speaking. Moses didn't just come up with it. As a, he, he's a prophet of God. Scripture, the Old Testament scripture was given by God through prophets. In fact, the scriptures are God breathed according to the apostles and to Jesus. And, and so God himself gave those words to Moses. Jesus, the Son of God, is giving credence and credibility to the Jewish understanding that the prophets had received their messages from God himself. And he's, and he's making this point that what God did in the beginning, his intent was good and it was in order and there was a plan. So let me say it to you this way. As Christians, we believe this. That, the, that God created the heavens and the earth, and he did so with such complexity and power. I mean, we've said this. When you look at the ecosystem, when you tilt the ecosystem in one little bit, it causes ramifications. There's such order. If the earth were one degree closer to the sun, we would fry. If it was one degree further away, we'd freeze. When you look at the order, of the natural laws that you see, there is such design on the planet, your eyes, your ears, how it all fits together. You see such power and complexity. The same God who created an earth with such complexity and power and design is the same God who ordered the marriage, gender, the family. He, he created order in his design. And so what Jesus is saying, you basically saying, you guys have come up with all these tweakings and all this messed up stuff. And, and so I'm going to point you back to the creator's design and his original intent. Now this is very important. You, you know, a few weeks ago we were talking about that that uh, there are many who are saying there is no absolute right or wrong, uh, moral objective right or wrong. And what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me. Well, I want you to understand, that's what led to these people saying, hey, whatever gender you think you are, doesn't matter if it corresponds to your parts, your biology, your reality, what's true for you is true for you. Truth has nothing to do with reality. There's multiple realities. And I want you to know that that leads to chaos in the family, chaos in the designed order of the universe. I want you to get this picture that as believers, we believe that what is true is what God says is true. Not what you think is true or what I think is true. Jesus is saying here when he's asked about marriage, God, my Father, said in the beginning, this is how it is. That's the truth. Are you with me so far? Now, as you go through this scripture, Jesus is giving credence to the word. He's pointing back to the original intent. And he's, he's making some declarative statements about marriage, about gender, about creation itself. Now, let's, uh, let's go back to that. Again, he's quoting from Genesis, and he says here a couple of things that are very important. He says, haven't you read? He replied that in the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no man separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. 
I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said, here's, here's our spiritual disciple makers, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all these, these disciples of Jesus. Here's their great spiritual comment to that. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. Here's their, here's their spiritual maturity. Well, if we have to stay married forever, then it's better just not to get married at all. Let's point out some things from this passage that I think are super important. Number one, the Bible says that God created man in his image. And then he goes on to say, he created them in his image, male and female. So I want you to get a picture of what this means. The Bible says there are two genders, male and female, with corresponding parts. Make sense to you? Now, again, um, are there rare occurrences where because of the brokenness of our world and genetic issues and those kinds of things, are there, there actual physical problems? Yep, it occasionally happens. That's a result of sin in the world and brokenness. But God said there will be two genders, male and female. He created them. Now, notice when he says he created mankind, and then he created, then he, he went further in detail. He said, man and woman, he created them. Here's what he's saying. If we're created in his image, and we are, that means we have, we're spirit, we have free will, the, the ability to choose. We're not puppets. God's not a puppet. God wasn't created in the physical, he didn't have a physical being, so we weren't created in his physical image. He's speaking about something spiritual, but he's saying that there's something physical. There's a physical reason why God created them with two genders. And he's saying that between male and female, that both of them together are going to represent God. They're going to be in his image together. In other words, let me say it this way. There's part of how God is that's expressed in womanhood, and there's part of how God is that's expressed in manhood. So there, these two each have different parts of who God is. In, there, in his image, he created them. And so they are unique, distinct, different than one another. Physically and spiritually, God created them to be different and yet work together. Very important that you understand that. Secondly, I want you to notice that he gave them a mission. They were to go into the world. They were to take dominion over the world, to rule the world. God said, you're created in my image. As I am a ruler, I'm giving you something to rule underneath me. And he says, you're to multiply. You are to procreate. These two genders are different spiritually, but they're different physically. But when they come together, they have the capacity to create a human being. God gave us the ability to procreate, to create something together. And it takes both of those parts if we're going to come together to produce a child, we're also going to come together to produce a good child. This mission was to create children together in partnership that were, that, 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 that were different and distinct from the parents, but had characteristics of the parents, had characteristics of God because parents were created in God's image. Now, I want you to get a picture of this. Not only did God say, I'm going to create genders, he said, I'm going to give you a mission in partnership with one another. You're going to rule and reign together and you're going to procreate, you're going to produce children together that fill the earth. But he also gave us a context for sex. He says that man will leave his father and mother, the, 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 the human beings would leave their father and mother, and they would come together, 
And then it goes on. Jesus says, what God has brought together, let no man separate. This, there's a marriage ceremony sort of thing where people leave where they came from to start a new family together. This is, this is as old as human beings in every culture on the planet. I know we live in a culture that thinks that we get to decide for ourselves. We get to create marriage to be anything we want it to be. But I want you to get this. We don't get to create marriage. We get to recognize what God created. Now, I want you to hear this. <laughs> marriage was instituted by God so that a male and female could come together be in partnership with one another, rule and reign together, procreate together, build a family together. And again, this has been recognized since time began until this century. Now again, I know if you cut the moorings of God, you know, the boat, you cut the, the anchor, it just drifts wherever it wants to go. Once you cut the moorings that hold the boat into one place, it drifts. And right now, we live in a culture that says, man, uh, remember last week, man, it, it, humans are the center of the world. We get to decide for ourselves. We get to do what we want. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden where the devil said, you know, I know God said if you live in his design, everything would be good, but he's just trying to keep you down. You deserve to be able to choose for yourself. You deserve to create your own world, to do things your own way. Of course, God said, if you do that, you'll die. You won't die. If you do it your way, you won't die. You won't destroy your relationships. You won't destroy your children. The world won't become full of chaos. That's just a lie from the pit of hell. Let me ask you a question. Who is telling the truth? I want you to see this. Marriage was God's idea between a male and a female for the purpose of doing life together, coming together, filling in the holes, creating families, showing kids what God fully looks like through the man and the woman as they come together. Well, I want you to notice that uh, Jesus makes it very clear and so does God, that there is a permanence about marriage. I mean, that's what Jesus' point here is. If, if, listen to what he says. He says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they will no longer be two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus goes on to say, your hearts were hard. But he goes on to say, if you divorce your wife for any reason other than adultery, when you're married having sex with somebody else, you commit adultery. Now, I, I want to say a couple of things about this. Marriage was meant to be permanent. It was meant to be two coming together to show what love looks like, committed love, an act of the will, to lay down your life for the other. It was designed to help bring stability to your life and, and bring stability into the life of your children. Jesus is saying, listen, we live in a broken world where you think you can divorce for any reason. Not so. Remember who Jesus is. He says, if you divorce for any, let me tell you why this is so important. You see, there's a whole bunch of people that they'll watch that video up there about gender and they'll go, oh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. They'll, next week as we talk about how sexual, uh, uh, sexual sin pro uh, progressed and, and where it went and what it's doing, you, you'll go, oh yeah, homosexuality, that's terrible. No, I want you to understand this. Why is it that Christians will go, oh, homosexuality is terrible, yet they will divorce their spouse because 
They just don't like them anymore. They just don't love them anymore. They just, you just don't do it for me anymore. We, we just can't get along. They, how is it that we can say that's okay, but this over here is wrong? Now, again, I know we have many people in our church that are divorced, and I'm not here to, to judge uh, you and, and to say you can't be free, because you can. The whole message of this is Jesus was dealing with a bunch of people in that century who had divorced for countless reasons. I mean, the Jews had been doing it, everybody had been doing it. Jesus came to say two things. What you're doing is sin, and I will forgive you if you've had enough of it. The message of the gospel is forgiveness no matter what you've done. But it's interesting to me how we can pick and choose sins, whichever sin we want, so that we can feel good about ourselves and point our fingers at somebody else. Jesus said, marriage is between a man and a woman the context for sex is marriage. Some of us are going, yeah, I don't believe in any of that, and I don't believe in divorce, but, but you know what? I'm going to live with somebody outside of marriage, and we're going to have sex and because we love each other, and everybody's doing it. No, I want you to get this. God has something to say about that too. Sex is a sacred act. And when you get it wrong, why does God say so much about sex and marriage? Well, because when you get it wrong, the consequences are terrible. Now the cool thing, again, hear me. God forgives and can clean up messes and he's done it. There are so many people around here that are walking, talking miracles of forgiveness. But it starts with us going, let's stick to the word of God Yes, he can recover things and restore things and heal things. And when we get it wrong, we need to confess it and get it right. We need to get back to getting it right. But too many of us don't know what the word says or we just ignore the parts we don't like. Everybody okay? I know I read this report to you a few years ago. I want you to know that not long ago, Dartmouth Medical School got together 33 top doctors. Because here's the problem. I'll, let, I'll just read what they said. A commission of 33 distinguished children's doctors, research scientists, and mental health and youth service professionals was formed because of the concern over the rising rates of mental illness behavioral problems, and emotional distress among U.S. children and teens. You guys are hearing all about the guns being shot at schools and all those things. Listen, folks, this was uh, three, four, five years ago. This isn't, nothing, this isn't, isn't new. The mental illness is going off the charts, and so they started to get together to figure out what in the world's going on, and these people weren't Christians. These people are scientists. And let me tell you, their conclusion was this. Biological systems predispose human beings to form and sustain enduring, nurturing relationships. Based on studies of both animals and human beings, neuroscientists have come to understand that a complex system of hormones and other chemical messages in the brain guides how we react to what's happening to and around us. An important part of the system biologically predisposes us to form and sustain strong attachments to other people. So here's what they go on to say. Because of the falling apart of the marriage, our children were designed to need stability and relationship. And because people are so involved in being so busy on technology, not having, they found two major problems. Human beings are predisposed genetically for deep relationships with other people that they've lost because of divorce, and they are, they're predisposed towards spiritual meaning as we cut our moors from the spiritual meaning and from family and permanence and relationship, we have mental illness going rampant. God's word has said that from the very beginning. We were designed for relationship with him and with others. That's why Jesus says all the law and the prophets are summed up and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbors as yourself. It's so funny how scientists, rather than go to God's word and get it right, always have to react to something that's already screwed up. 
And then they've had, well, look what we discovered. Duh! It's been right here since creation. God has made it very clear to us in his word, and it was reaffirmed in Christ Jesus himself. Again, please hear me. Some of us have made mistakes, and we can't push rewind. I'm so glad when we reach up to him, he takes us right where we are, and he starts to rebuild. He starts to make miracles out of things that are broken. I'm so grateful for that. But doggone it, I would sure rather not jack things up to begin with if I can help it. How about you? Well, within marriage, there is partnership. Within marriage, there is working together to create children who understand the image of God. Parents are models as they understand God and they walk with God. They're models of who God is and they not only pass off information, but they become a living model of love for their kids to see and reproduce. We don't want just kids who can reproduce physically because they're anatomically created for that. We want kids to come together with somebody else to create grandkids who know who God is and who love and partner and work and serve. And because of the devil's lies, his confusion, we have people that, that don't know whether there should be genders and they don't know whether we should be married and they don't know whether we should... If human relationship is the most important thing we were created for other than relationship with God, then it makes sense that the devil would cloud and pollute and corrupt every form of relationship to create a complete disaster zone. And that's what we're living in. And the key to this is to go back to God's word to say, yes, Jesus, we are done doing it our way. You had an intention. We didn't listen in the garden, but we have learned from our experience on, on planet Earth. You were right. And now we want your will. Your word is a light into our path. You didn't just save us from hell. You saved us from the consequences of living and learning how to live down here without you. This is the jacked up place, and I'm so tired of being jacked up. Lastly, I want you to turn to Ephesians 5. God has given us his word, his spirit, and Jesus is a model. Jesus became the model of what it's supposed to look like for the disciples. The disciples were supposed to make disciples who understood what it looked like, what was the original intent. Jesus came down to show us the directions for how to use this thing again, this world. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 5. He's talking about the family. He's been talking about what it's supposed to look like. What is life supposed to look like? When he gets to the family, he says this. He says, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, because you revere and honor Christ, you submit to Christ in everything you do. Submit to one another. Humble ourselves between one, uh, uh, amongst ourselves. Rather than saying, you exist for me, we're like Jesus and we say, I love you. It's an act of the will to lay down your life for another. Pride kills relationship. Humility gives us the potential to be in relationship again. He goes on, wives, here's, here's the roles, equal value. God made the genders to have equal value who come together, but there are roles, different roles. Remember it back in the garden when they sinned, Jesus, or uh, God, the, God said in the garden, said to the woman, your desire will be for your husband, but now he will rule over you. See, some of us don't understand what that means. In the Hebrew, it means, woman, because of sin now, your desire will be to rule your husband, but your husband will rule over you. You will have a battle for control in the home now. When Jesus comes, though, he says, listen, here's the key to, to stopping the battle. 
out of reverence for Christ because he's the king, because he's the designer, you submit and surrender to him. And he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. In other words, you are not fighting him for control anymore. You're coming alongside him. You're submitting to his leadership as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now he's about to talk about Jesus and Jesus' relationship with the church. And he uses this picture that the, the church is like the woman and Jesus is like the man. And so he uses this model for us to follow. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits... To Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. That means that you surrender to the Lord out of reverence for Christ. I'm not going to fight for, for control anymore. Some of you men are going, oh man, that would be wondrous. What would happen if I was in control? If you're asking that question, you don't understand what Jesus means by leadership. Leadership. Now he says to the husband, listen to this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And listen to this. And gave himself up for her. He says to the man, leadership is not a privilege to be abused or used with other people. You don't lord it over people as the Gentiles do. You lay down your life to serve as Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, washed his disciples' feet, as he laid down his life on the cross, did he lead? Yes. His disciples said, no, don't go to the cross. Jesus said, no, I will go to the cross. He led to his own death because what was best for his bride was his dying on the cross. There are roles He goes on, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her through the word. In other words, guys, leadership means that you have surrendered to the Lord Jesus and now you lead your family to the cross. You are a spiritual leader. It's not your wife's job to do the devotions, although that's fine, but you, you don't advocate your role. Your job is to say, I'm going to lead my family to the cross and help them know Jesus. I'm going to help wash my family in the word and to present her to himself a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Here's the deal. In a world of, I'll serve you if you serve me first. In a world of you, you serve me. No, no, you serve me. No, you serve me if I said, no, no. He says, listen, as believers, we stop the battle. We surrender to the Lord Jesus and we play our roles together as a partnership, knowing God, seeing the brilliance of God in one another, understanding our roles of procreating people who not only fill the earth with biological forms, but with spiritual people who love God and love others. As Christians, now I know, let me just count all the ways this is uh, contrary to our culture. Jim, you said there's actual genders. Yep, I did. Jim, you said marriage is supposed to be permanent until death do you part. Yep, I did. Jim, you said there's actual roles in the home. People have equal value but different roles and women should submit to their husbands. I did. Jim, you said that a husband, you know, he's supposed to serve and care for his wife and die to himself. And a hero is one who has the courage to die for others rather than control. That, you know, listen, in, in a world of, hey, it's about me. I've hit the top. I'm at number one. No, you're saying, no, number one is servant. Yep, I said that too. 
It's not, none of those things are what the world teaches. You, Jim, you said sex is in marriage, and it should not be done outside of that. Yep, I said that too. That's not popular either. But let me just ask you a question. Look around. How is it working for us to do it our way? Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And the cool thing about that is everything he has ever done for us is because he loves us, he knows how he made us, he's right and he's good. And when you live according to his design, it's not perfect because we still don't live in heaven. We still have the devil, we still have a sinful nature, we still have people making decisions that hurt us. We still make mistakes ourselves, but we're forgiven. We're on the right trajectory. And someday, Jesus is going to make all things right. No more devil, no more sin, no more dying, no more struggle, no more sinful nature that I wish would just go away. Man, I get so sick of the things that come to my mind. I'm just so sick of the battles in my head. I can't wait until those are gone. And we lived as it was intended. This time, though, We know that everything he ever said was for our good and we trust him because we tried it the other way and it jacked us all up. 